Ah, okay. Now they can hear me. How's it going, people? I bet you did not expect to see me here. Are you going to be doing incident response with Splunk? Um, how do you do this, bro? What's that? What are we doing? We're live. Where's try me? We're going to pull it up in a bit. I have no idea how to pronounce that name, bro. How's it going, though? <laughs> Let me switch this. All right, bet. All right, it looks like we're back on. Sorry about that. We had an imposter try to hijack the live. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's, let's get this music rolling. We should have Teddy joining a bit. I don't know why he didn't join the stream immediately. But let's see. Perfect. All right, all right, all right. I think we're live. Man. Welcome, everyone. Happy Friday. How's everybody doing? How was your week? Well, help me ask Teddy why he hasn't joined the stream yet. I literally can't hear you. This is like noise canceling headphones. Okay. Yo, can people see me? Which yeah. Vernus is here to join us. Huh? So Vernus is here to join us. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. Bro, it's so weird hearing you twice. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to turn out the mic a little bit? I can really hear myself. Turn up the mic? Turn down. Okay. There's like a volume controls like on the knob, like on the uh, mic itself. You see it like on the side. Is it good? Check. Hello. I can turn myself a little bit. Hello. Hello. Okay, not that bad. I can still hear myself. Check. Okay, that's good. Oh, no. That was... Is it Should be now? fine. Should be good. Can you hear Should me? Should be good. I can hear you. Okay. Just don't speak too loud. <laughs> yeah. All right, all right, all right, all right. By the way, if you guys can tell, like, this is our first time doing this. Or doing it like this. Uh... This guy's literally behind me in my house. Um, <laughs> uh, this is like kind of last minute, actually. So we're like, you know what? Let's uh, actually just like come together and just like do a stream together. Especially since it's the finale, right? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Mammy? Is there. Is the room free to play? Is it what? Is the room free? Do you mean? Room? Uh, I don't think it is. I'm not sure. I am not subscribed currently. Yeah, I think it's for subscribers only. Okay. Yeah, man. Get good, bro. Come on, man. What are you doing? Why are you not subscribed track me? We're about to hop in the chat in a bit. Just want to make sure everything's all set up. You know, we're kind of like... We're not new to this, but like, you know... It's our first bro. time doing this. LinkedIn user. How's it going, Mr. LinkedIn user? Or Mrs. It's kind of difficult to tell these days. Yeah. All right, let's get to the chat. What's going on in the chat? Hello, hello. How's it going? Welcome. Welcome. See you from Dallas, Texas. Hey, from Sanford, NC. That's uh, North, North Carolina, Carolina, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. LOL. Yeah. I know it's kind of funny. I don't like Amazon. Um... Amazon. It's been good so far, you know. 
Amazon's Amazon. <laughs> what do you mean Amazon's Amazon? It's Bush, Bush trying to steal the pot. That's great. Um, you know, learn a lot, um, get a lot of experience. Um, yeah, just a lot of really good stuff going on. So, yeah. You might like, it, by the way. Your mic is in focus. Oh, my mic is in focus? Yeah, not you. Oh, uh, there you go. That's my fault. So I can put this down a little bit. All right. I'm going to put my drink. Dang, I can literally hear that. Anyways, what's good? How's it going? I'm doing all right. How about yourself? That's great to hear, Michael. How was your week? Hey, Richard. How's it going? Have I taken the TCM Detection Engineer course? No, I have not actually. Um, I have it in my course list, but I haven't yet. But it looks like a pretty good course, actually. I kind of have it as well. I can probably take a look at it right now. Yeah, it looks like a pretty good course, like Detection Engineering wise. I don't think there's any course like that out there or many like it out there. So I can see. Awesome. Nice. That's good because that one is going to be the um, predecessor to this stream. So um, if you've not watched previous streams, like the last three streams, actually, I definitely recommend checking those, but not until you're done watching this. So, yeah. All right. Stay tuned. Good. You said what? I said stay tuned. Yes, yeah, sir. Good evening. How's it going? Bro, this guy's called Sir. <laughs> yeah, he's a Sir, man. Royalty. Just passed the spawn power. He's like, congrats. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty uh, advanced one. But like the one above the uh, the core user. Congrats on that. That's a great achievement. Hey, hey. Yo. Was good. Was good. We got Rex stuck in the house, y'all. By the way, I know this guy, bro. Yeah. What? In the in the chat? Yeah, isn't he the former athlete? Yeah. He um what was I about to say? Yeah, I was gonna say congrats on passing that DevOps Pro if I that's like amazing. He just passed his uh, AWS DevOps Pro. Like that's like that's like one of the hardest like AWS uh, certifications. Shout out to you for that, man. Congrats, bro. Yep. I see his LinkedIn post every day, bro. I'm on the grind. Bro, super consistent, bro. Like, yeah. Insane. 4 a.m. Bro, the 4 a.m. Like, those are insane. Hey, hey. We got, we got folks from all over the world. I see you from Ghana. From How's it Ghana, going over bro. there? Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. What's up, Jerry Martin? Sup, sup. <laughs> it's hot in Topeka, Kansas. I've been, I've been in Kansas um, a couple of times, <laughs> but not Topeka, Kansas. <laughs> Kansas. Yeah. Stay in room. I have to take this in the next three months. Oh, what inspired you to choose this topic? Splunk. Bro, everybody needs to know Splunk. Why don't you know Splunk? Splunk right. is like, you know, very popular, so. Yes, sir. That's why I chose it. I'm going through it now, I can give you a review afterwards. Shout out to Grandview Success. I got you with the beard, man. Oh, oh my goodness. Wait, what I'm, I'm so bad. I am so bad. Like, I feel like, I feel like I know who this is. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm so bad. Like, we had a conversation because I'm trying to grow my beard out, and like, I never followed up on a conversation. Yeah. But yeah, shout out to you, man. I appreciate you. Bro, we, 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 get, we get it. 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 It's probably going to fully grow up by the end of the year. Hopefully. Bro, you've been had beards, bro. Like, it's all right, bro. We got it. Scared of Security Plus for February 14th. Yeah, I'm sure you do fine. Uh, Scary Plus is a fairly, like, uh, not, I won't say straightforward, but, you know, definitely one that is not, like, incredibly difficult. So. Yeah, for sure. Good luck. Best of luck. Best. That's all. I'm I'm happy to hear that. Song is awesome. Where did you get the that. music? This is from uh, Epidemic Sound. I uploaded I uploaded it to Streamyard. Okay. okay. 
Yeah. It was just one song in the loop or something? Yeah, it's the same song in the loop. I need to get a new song for my my next couple of streams because after we finish, well, we're still going to do Splunk, but yeah, I need to get a new song because it's going to get repetitive. But yeah, it's such an easy going song. Bro, I'm sure. I've heard things about that exam. Yeah. Congrats Is it harder than the security one then? Dev, DevOps one? I don't know. Does, does Infinite have the security specialty? Let's see. I don't know. I think the that one is the DevOps price is harder than the security specialty for AWS. He did the DevOps Pro. Yeah, he passed the DevOps Pro. Okay. Yeah. Let me see. Let's see. I don't know if he has a DevOps Pro. So let me check his profile. Because he has a he has a you know a couple, maybe like a couple, maybe like a ton of. Well, he has the spe yeah, so he has the security specialty. I mean, he has I a, do the security specialty. Yeah, I eventually want to do that one, but got another plans. All right, I think we've caught up with the chat. Um, we can get into today's lab. So, for context, you'd want to have watched the first part of the lab. Uh, which was the last last week's stream um in order to like you know be familiar with this I'm, trying to, I'm still trying to figure out why i'm still hearing like myself do you hear me in your in your earbuds like beyond just like the stream yard can you hear i mean me? I can you talking next to me i know <laughs> <laughs> i know but i can literally hear myself like from your mic in my in my ears i don't know bro is it better? Say it again. It's probably off at this point, isn't it? Yeah, the volume's like really low. Really low. Really low. And now? Really low. I heard myself as well now. Huh? <laughs> it's like Inception. You good? Yeah, we should be good. What are the people saying? In the era? Yeah, I think we should, we, should, we, should, we should get a general consensus from people. How do, you, how do we sound? Like, how do we sound? Let me go to YouTube. I'm gonna YouTube and see. You said what? Put a one in the chat if we sound okay. Bet, bet, bet. Yeah, I want to see what it, how it sounds uh, in YouTube. Jimmy Johnson says volume is okay. Okay, let me see. Why doesn't it show the names of people commenting on LinkedIn? It shows some, not all though. Yeah, I think Kevin says we sound good, so. Okay. I mean, if we sound good, that's that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Everyone, everyone said like, sound is great. Okay. 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 I'm the one who's tripping. My apologies, guys. My apologies. My apologies. I apologize. All right. Sound is good. Sound is good. Sound is good. Sound is good. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for joining the stream. Um, let me go ahead and uh, turn the music down. But yeah, today we're going to continue with uh, the Splunk we were working on last week. Um, let me actually just pull it up here. It's the handle with Splunk. All right, let me go ahead and What is it called? It's in the handle with Splunk. Search. I'm just going to pull you guys over here. Go ahead and share my screen. Nope. Let that. Present share screen. Bruh. What? It's for subscribers only. Yeah, unfortunately. Okay, I'll All just right. watch. You said what? I said I'll just watch on the screen. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can like provide inputs, inputs and feed feedback from your perspective as a pen tester. By the way, we didn't even do introductions, bro. Like, who is this guy? Like, literally, like in my stream. Like, no, who is this guy in my stream, bro? Who's this? Who are you? Who am I? Yeah, introduce um, yourself, sir. Don't run the command when you get a shell <laughs> on a machine because they know that you're probably not supposed to be there. Was that a good joke? No. Okay. Uh, I, was, I was lost. <laughs> Who am I? My name is Tati. I am a security engineer. 
and the focus is on penetration testing. Um, security engineer because I also do a bunch of stuff from like DevOps and what else do I do? Threat modeling. I do a lot of threat modeling. It's probably the most I do right now. Um, yeah, I've been working as a penetration tester for over a year, probably like a year and five, six months now. What does that do? 18 months. Um, anything else? I'm based in Dallas, Texas, of course. Originally from Zimbabwe, so shout out to the South. Man, yeah. That's what's up, man. Uh, by the way, we did a video together like uh, like last year. Was it last year? Yeah, we did that video together last year. Um, Was that last year? It had to be last year. Could have been 2022, bro. Oh, that would have been crazy. If it was 2022, then that's actually insane. But I'll drop a link to um, the video that Taddy and I did. Um, it's like one of the Cyber cyber Stories podcast episodes. Um, it basically kind of talked about his journey to becoming a um, an ethical hacker. Yes, it was 11 months ago. Oh, that could have been that could actually been 2022. Pretty sure that was 2022, bro. No, it was 2023, February 6th, literally February? a year ago. Yes, literally a year ago. Just a couple of days away. Crazy. Yeah, but Teddy and I did a, a video together um, about um, how to get into offensive security, how he did it. He's my fourth guest on the Cyber Stories podcast, so uh, you know, definitely been writing since. Uh, but we've been we've known each other before that, but like for for a minute. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, he's on the stream joining us today to uh, kind of join with uh, the fun on looking at how we're going to investigate this uh, action objectives here, and we're going to investigate the uh, command and control phase, the weaponization phase, and the delivery phase. In the last stream, we went over the incident handling lifecycle, the incident handling scenario, the reconnaissance phase, the exploitation phase, the installation phase, um, and now we're going to go over the rest of that. By the way, we're kind of following the kill chain here. So uh, if you're not familiar with the cyber kill chain, uh, actually I actually have a video on that coming up soon. Uh, but basically, it starts from reconnaissance to weaponization to delivery, exploitation, installation, command and control, and then actions on objectives. Uh, so in the this is a recap of the way. In the reconnaissance phase, we kind of observed uh, the attacker, you know, doing some reconnaissance on this website called I'm Really Not Batman, right? Uh, they went over a couple of things on that website, just trying to find uh, what exists in the website. And we actually got a couple of um, alerts from the Suricata IDS that's um, actually supposed to be protecting this website. Um, and we saw that um, there was an alert for um, an attack for this specific CVE. Um, we also were able to find out the CMS, uh, which is the what's the CMS again? Content management system that the website was using. And we also saw that the web, the attacker was scanning using the Acunetics, excuse me, the Acunetics web scanner. And then uh, we also were able to find out the web, the IP address of the server uh, that we're uh, we're investigating here. The Wait, so server. did you finish this well? No. No, I didn't. Oh, so okay. I'm finishing it up. Yeah, yes. so I did the first half, and the plan is to finish the second half today. All right, next, next is the exploitation phase. So we went over um, how the attacker actually was able to get into the environment. Um, I believe this was this was this was through a brute force attack. Um, we actually saw a bunch of um, failed attempts, um, you know, for the login into the server, username and password uh, combinations that were all wrong except for one which we eventually found out at the end uh during our investigation we found out this was the uh end, end point or the uri that the attacker was attempting to brute force into um for the admin username and we eventually found that the password was batman because that was the successful request um during uh during that brute force attack and we saw that there were 412 unique uh password uh, that were uh, attempted during the brute force attack uh, during the brute force attack and there was also the IP address that was attempted a brute force attack. Um, the cool thing about this was that this IP address um, did all the brute force attacks. However, when the correct password was discovered, um, actually, I'm just name my headphones. When the correct password was discovered, um, the attacker then used this IP address to log in 
to the website. And the way we were able to identify this was because this IP address used a different user agent, right? It was a Python user agent that ran all the buffers at attacks. And then after that, um, the attacker then logged into the web page just using this IP address, which was a very interesting um, uh, thing that we discovered during this, uh, what's it called again? I believe this is the exploitation phase. So what they are hosting their buffer script on? You say what? A server somewhere in the cloud maybe? Uh, I think the server is probably hosted in an internal environment. I think the server is like hosted in like a, uh, I believe it, I think we saw what the server was. It's 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 a Windows system actually. Um, I think it's a, it's an IIS server if I'm not mistaken. Um, so uh, yeah, yeah, it was hosted within like an internal network, uh, and then they were able to brute force and log into it uh, using yeah using a brute force attack. I feel like I'm so disconnected from such things. What do you like mean brute forcing? Because that's not something we do when we're doing penetration tests. Oh, that's definitely not going to be like a test case. You don't, you're going to try go into brute force. Nah. Yeah, that's a fair point. Real quick, let me ask in the chat. Uh, does my mic still have an echo? I try to control it a bit. Let me know in the chat if it still has an echo. Uh, if it's good now, let me know. If not, uh, I might need to turn on my mic a bit. But if it's good now, just let me know. But yeah, like you said, like in a penetration test, uh, you're not going to be brute forcing because that's probably going to be against your uh, rules of engagement, right? Yep. Chat says there's an echo. Yeah, yeah. I, I I just asked if there's still an echo. Uh, oh, is it a little? Wait, let me turn it down a little bit more. Is there still an echo? Let me know. But yeah, like you said, uh, in, in a penetration test, it's not going to be um, brute force. Uh, but I mean, penetration tests are like basically just emulations, right? Like an attacker probably wouldn't do the same thing, except if it's like I feel like an APT would probably um, employ different methods. But I feel like there's like, what I, I mean, when I was in the SOC, there's like a bunch of like, you know, random IP addresses hosted in AWS um, or like Digital Ocean, like doing brute force attacks against like different like public servers. So like the, the rules are different from uh, for attackers yeah, and sure. for penetration testers. Are you guys are not allowed to break stuff, really. <laughs> it's like uh, break stuff within these confines. That's how, you, that's how you guys work, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, pretty true. All right. This is still a bit of echo. Let me know. Is it better now? Is it better now? I'm just turning down my mic a little bit here and here, here and there. But um, yeah, so like you guys have to follow your your rules and engage, rules of engagements in terms of like how you um, deal with like the company servers and stuff like that. But it does make sense. But well, let me know if there's still an echo. It comes and goes. Huh? Interesting. Wonder why. Let's see. Do you want to put a muffler on your mic? Me? Yeah. Where's the thing? From your mic, going from my mic, yeah. Oh, all right, all right. cool. Yeah, you can do that. But uh, yeah, we we're, we're trying to put the muffler on uh, Teddy's mic just in case, like it's from my end. Hi, right. are you good? All right, let us know if, 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 if the echo persists uh, before we get into the rest of it. But yeah, it does make sense that you guys uh, have your uh, rules of engagement that kind of guide what you guys do and what, what you can do and what you can't do. But have you, have you, have you ever, uh, this is like a random a side question. Have you ever done like a, uh, an engagement where, and you know, of course, like, you know, you can kind of like uh, limit the information you want to provide, of course, to, pr uh, uh, to protect your the confidentiality of, of your clients. But have you ever done a, a case whereby you had a lot of freedom that you've never had? No. <laughs> no, uh, there's always going to be scope that you have to adhere to. Right. So specifically things that are out, out of scope, do not touch those. Mm -hmm. And then work on whatever is in scope and then whatever is in scope also has its own scope because there's certain things you can't do like brute force um i mean obviously you could try base conditions like turbo intruder and edc but you can't really you know go overboard gotcha gotcha so it seems like we have to lower your gain teddy not mine mine yeah Oh, it says your mic is picking up my voice. Yeah, it is. 
Yeah. Speak so loud. I speak so loud. Yes. You, you know, that's a crazy thing. Because I've told you before that you, you speak so softly in your videos. Guys, let me know if you've watched Teddy's videos. Let me know if, if he speaks softly in his videos. Because I'm like, literally just screaming in my mic and you tell me I speak softly. I, I tell Teddy all the time like he, he should, like he needs to like speak up in his videos, but like I feel like he speaks like too softly in his videos. Ah, uh, yeah. So like, yeah, I feel like as long as both mics are on, like one of us has to mute ourselves. If it was OBS, like it would be better because like OBS has like that um what you call it that um um gain suppressor or noise suppressor. What do, how do you what do you how do you how do you plan to do this? Um, I mean, I guess I, I'm going to be doing most of the investigation. You can like unmute yourself if you want to say something real quick, and then we can like just go back and forth from there. How's that? Yeah, I'll unmute myself when I want to talk. All right, bet bet bet. Let's do this. All right, thank you guys so much in the chat for like uh, giving us all these feedback. Um, it's very helpful. Um, that way we know that you know that sounds good. By the way, let me know if like the screen is all good and everything. Um, I just enlarged this just to make sure that. Um, it's viewable. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and start the attack box here. Um, and I think I've provided enough context into what happened. I actually don't think I went over the installation phase. So the installation phase was like uh, kind of one of the interesting phases. I think here, um, you have the attacker drop in a stager in the Windows system um, that uh, belongs to yeah, the, the host, right? The, the attacker dropped the stager, I believe, which is uh, this 3791.exe. Um, executable, and I believe this stager was supposed to, um, at least from what I think uh, was going to happen, um, to grab some more files or grab some more stuff or maybe do some reconna reconnaissance in the network um, and then send that back to the mothership um, through com command and control, uh, which I, 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 I think we're going to investigate here. So, <laughs> so yeah, that was what the um, the installation phase looked like. I see we have you in the chat. Now, Teddy's voice kind of quiet, so I'll speak with that, I guess. <laughs> My question before we get into action on objectives, is all of this realistic? Is it, because it seems easy, this investigation, and like from what you've explained, either you're like very good ex at explaining things, or this is like kind of sandboxed and easy in a sense. Is it like real world applicable? I think it's actually like, uh, v like I think it's actually a real case because those are real IP addresses, um, and I think I think this was actually like a um, a honeypot um, that was set up because it does seem like the IP address that was part of it uh, or the IP addresses are actual like legitimately like uh, malicious IP addresses. Uh, I think if I could so IP abuse. DB here. <laughs> Bro, chat is going crazy. That's hilarious. Um, and put that in there. So this is a, from a Microsoft uh, IP address. No uh, abuse reported. Um, let me see for the 22 IP address. Um, it might also be like a rotated IP address, maybe like a, for like a, a, a server that's hosted in, in Azure or something. Let me see. Um, trying to find the other IP address, but I, I do think this is like really legitimate. I don't think it was simulated. Um, I don't think so at all. I'm trying to find the 22 IP, uh, the 23 IP address here. Let's pull that up. Ah, there we, there we go. Let me plug that in there. Okay, so this IP address has been reported a couple. So this was the IP address I was doing the um, abuse, and it's also on an EC2 instance. And it seems like this was reported a year ago for blog spam by David Chinney. Let's see who this is. Is that the creator of the room then? I don't know, maybe like a security researcher or something. Okay, so this person is like a this person. Oh, okay, so this person. Oh, okay, okay. This is kind of interesting because what if this person did this lab <laughs> and then went to report it? 
like they did a lab and they're like, ooh, this is a this is an IP, this is a malicious IP address. Let's go report it. Because it does look like they do like uh they they do a uh, defensive security. Um so what if they did the lab and then they went to go report it um to IP abuse? Dude, that would be kind of hilarious. I wonder if that was the case. Because that was the only report for the IP address. Um but it does seem simulated. I have a feel well, well, it might not be. It might not be. Because I think this is this this is the boss of the SOC data set, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and the boss of the SOC data set, I believe, is originally from Splunk. Um, so it could have been like that they actually um, built this out. Um, if we go to boss of the SOC, and we go over here. What's, what's boss of the SOC? Are you not familiar with boss of the SOC? No. Okay, that's like a blue team thing. Let me explain boss of the SOC to you. So boss of the SOC is a uh, perfect. I can just read this, read off this. Boss of the sock is, come on. All right. So last year we introduced a new security activity at Splunk, the conf 2016. So this is a like a really old thing. Um, the concept of Boss of the sock was born from our core beliefs that Splunk is an indispensable tool for all information security teams and that learning can be both realistic and fun. The first Boss of the sock uh, was a huge hit with over 150 participants. It ended up being one of the biggest events at .com. That's kind of like the CTO for Blue Teamers. Essentially. Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. I see. Yeah, essentially. Thanks. That's crazy. Wait, Wait, so you're doing like investigations? Yeah, you're investigating like in a... Yeah. That's really cool. It's like investigation, hunting, response. Like you can essentially use the data set to do whatever sort of like Blue Team investigation you want to do. And this is, I think this is Bustle of the Sock 1. This is Bustle of the Sock 2. What's of the sock three? I actually have all of them pulled up here. So, uh, yeah. So there's boss of the sock, uh, two right here. Boss of the sock three. I believe boss of the sock, uh, and they all have like different cases. So actually, I might be wrong. I think it's actually simulated because, um, they actually have like those 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 um, the data set is like very specific. Um, so in this case, boss of the sock two is investigating an APT. I believe this is for. Also Windows, um, so there's a bunch of questions here you gotta answer. Uh, I do think it's yeah. So like this email, there's email like data sets here. There is um, web data sets here. There's also um, MacBook uh, data set. So maybe probably like like Mac based uh, telemetry uh, as well. Uh, DNS telemetry as well. Um, there's other things too, so maybe like host based telemetry as well. And then there's um the conclusion. So there's that. Um and then Splunk 3. I think the, the bus of the SOC 3 is um AWS based. So it's crypto mining based. Um so that's like the latest one. Uh, I believe this is the latest one. Uh I don't know if there's a a, 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 a bots for yet. But yeah, that's that's the whole concept behind Bus of the SOC, in case you anyone else aside from Teddy was not familiar with it. Make sense? Yep. Yep, 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 yep. I think we should get started now. It's All right. Bad, bad, bad. Cool, 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 cool. All right. So let's just open in full screen. And then uh, use a split view. Cool, cool. Action on objectives. All right. Let's go ahead and get started with action on objectives. So. As the website was defaced due to a successful attack by the adversary, it would be helpful to understand better what ended up on the website that caused defacement. As an analyst, our first quest could be to figure out the traffic flow that could lead us to the answer to this question. There can be a different approach. Finding the answer to this question, we'll start our investigation by examining the server log source and the IP addresses communicating with the web server 192.168.250 dot 70. I actually do wonder, am I saving this locally? I don't know. Anyways, we'll see. All right. So this is a search query for that. Um, I don't think I put it on. Can you do it after? Uh, No. Dang. I'm just going to have to deal with the quality that it comes out with. It's all good, though. Well, let's blow Splunk. Uh, let's see. Ten dot. All right. 
10, 10, 122, 64. Whoa. All right, let's see what I'm missing here. Oh, it's not, uh, dude. This always happens. Oh my goodness, this always happens. Oh, by the way, this is the most of the Sulk version one, um, the V one. So, yeah, I apologize about that. I thought I started the machine, and I realized I didn't start the machine. But, anyways, let's go. Let's continue uh, looking at the action objectives. So it does look like right now we're looking for, um. IP addresses communicating with the web server. Um, so we know that the website was defaced because that was part of uh, what we got in the scenario. If you missed that context, um, let's see. So yeah, so the 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 website we're dealing with here is Win, Win for Win Enterprises, and it was defaced with this, right? So we do know that. That's how we got that context. So it wasn't like they just fabricated that. That was their motive. So we want to see how that happened. Um, and we're going to do that using this uh, query to first look at uh, the IP addresses that we're communicating with the server. Um, but based on the server called a um, source type, because that's what the IDS was. Let's go ahead and grab that. Copy that. And let's go ahead and try this again. Oopsie. 10, 10, 76, 112. All right. 10, 10, 76, 112. Let's try again. Oh, maybe HTTP. What the heck is going on? Okay. That is weird. <laughs> Mission is started and everything. What am I missing? What are you supposed to do? Connect to the IP address? Using the attack machine. Hmm? Yeah. yeah. What am I missing? Do I have to start Splunk or something? Bad gateway usually means you say what? It's working, but it's not working. Yeah, because like yeah, it's probably a bad gateway. So I wonder. Oh, okay. It takes three to five minutes to start up. Ugh, dude. <sighs> well, in case you you haven't noticed, we're we're kind of new to this, so new to the streaming thing and this whole triacme thing. So just gonna wait for this to, to come up. I wonder why it's like taking this long. It wasn't the it was like a lot faster like last time that I did I did it. Da -da -da. I don't want to. I don't want to like and close the attack box and start it all over again. What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Should we end the attack box and start it over again? Because it should. It should. It should. It should be. It should be good by now. You know what? Uh, Let's restart it. Whatever happened is in the past. We can move forward. All right. Let's try this again. Close this up. Close streaming this up. is crazy, bro. You said what? I said streaming is pretty difficult. In oh my goodness, bro. Tell me about it. All right. We'll make it work, though. We'll make it work, though. We'll make it work, though. I got the same exact server. <laughs> uh, all right. We'll make it work, though. We'll make it work. We'll make it work. Should be good. Uh, let me open this uh, in a full screen. And... This will show up in um, 26 seconds. All right, I'm going to exit this split view here. All right, while we wait for that, well, we have 18 seconds. What can we do in 18 seconds? 
Uh, so we're, we're looking into the action on objectives. Yeah, I, I wanna I wanna wait for this to come up before I, I go into that. Let's wait for it. We'll go five seconds. All right, people. Let me entertain you. Let me tell you a dad Time's joke. Up. Time's up. <laughs> <laughs> this guy does not like him. All right, let's let's see if this works now. Patient go. Please, please be the one. Be the one. <laughs> That's way too long. <laughs> it's waiting for my dad joke. Stop. Uh, let me make this HTTP. Why? Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. Come on. We got to make this work. We're going to make this work. Uh, okay, let me do this. Uh, show split view and let me terminate this and then terminate this as well. All right, how do you go ahead with your, with your, with your dad jokes while I start this? Okay, so why did the chicken cross the street? <laughs> because? Oh, is that funny? No. I think it was funny. What's the joke? I missed it. Okay, let me let me try this again. Why did the chicken cross the street? Uh I don't know. Because <laughs> uh stop. <laughs> stop. This is not like a chicken, but my impression is pretty terrible. Yeah, why we'll wait for this to? Why we'll wait this? We'll wait for this. Let's, let's go into the the chat real quick and see what's happening. Chat doesn't like my dad jokes. <laughs> let's see. Let's see. Let's let's see. Love it. this. Is a, I think this is a good good comment. Uh, very dynamic. A blue and red team are doing a lab. I can imagine you guys would probably love insight. Yeah, Teddy, do you do red team engagements? I've done half a red team engagement. <laughs> let's see your face. Your 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 mouth is like. Oh, under the uh, uh the banner okay i don't have a routine engagement yeah i think i think you should, we should do you want to like clarify what's the difference between a red team and a penetration tester we should what we should clarify what the difference between a red team and a penetration tester is because they're different oh, yeah i mean red team engagements last longer there's always an objective that they start from and they do whatever they want to do basically they have like no scope for the most part whoa um and also just depends on the objective of the because there's always going to be an objective they can start from certain points or start from zero starting from zero would be everything from drones uh physical penetration testing trying to get into the building social engineering etc or they start from a simulated um compromise where they assume someone has been compromised so they create fake credentials for a developer and then so like a zoom breach yeah 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 yeah. so they assume that developer has been breached and they start from there acting as the bad guys that's usually the case nowadays i think based off some of the red team reports i've read from different companies and yeah, that stuff can span for months. It's pretty fun, though. Yeah, I would think that um, red team engagements would be more um, like, you know, kind of APT focused or something like that, where it's like you're trying to emulate, let's say like you work in the financial industry, um, but you're trying to emulate, let's say like Fin, I don't know, Fin2, whoever, APT exists there for financial industry. Um, and you just kind of like employ their tactics to see if your company is um, susceptible to them. Yeah, and with the red team, you're not really looking for comprehensive checks. You usually go for like the weakest link to get in. Unlike penetration testing, where we have to test everything based on the test cases and the scope. With the red teaming, you're probably just looking for a way in, and whatever that way in is, what you end up documenting. Um, I haven't really seen a red team engagement where they they get in and then they try go back in with a different way. It's usually that whatever. However they get in is how they document, but obviously they're going to map up, map out like the environment and 
see what works best. And obviously they could uncover a couple of vulnerabilities. Those will be reported as well. This guy's happy. I think the lab worked. Yes, we got it to work. We got it to work, but let's not discount what we had in the chat. Um, but yeah, thanks for giving insights into that. Um, let's see what else we have in the chat. Hey, thanks, Ron. Thanks, Ron. Thanks for the support. We've got it to work now. So thank you guys so much. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Just not your dad jokes. Because he got it. He got it. He got it. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so I was great friends. Hey, look, if you're in the stream, we're friends. See that? Join the Discord. Join the so Discord. we can actually like be better friends. We can be best friends. Let me send you the invite right Easy. now. Best friends on Discord. That's pretty cool. Best I've met some of the coolest people yeah, on Discord. I'm I've met like some of, like bro, I've met like some of the coolest people ever on Discord. Like, Discord is like such a underrated space. Like it's better than like Twitter, um, LinkedIn, all of that. Like it's so it's like so underrated. Um, yeah. Let me I just wish I had the energy to participate in my server more. Yeah, you do have a server. I do. Dude, I open it like once a week, bro. I have, I have no energy for social media except for LinkedIn. I find most of my stuff on LinkedIn, like content ideas. That's why I'm always on there. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. But yeah, just drop the drop the link to the Discord. Teddy, you want to drop your link to your Discord if you know if you want to put it in there. But uh, yeah, we got this thing to work. Thankfully, that was kind of like just a bummer because I don't know why it wasn't working. But we're we're back on we're back on now. So let's get started with this. All right, so let's go straight into search and reporting. Um, just so that you guys are familiar, we'll just start by orienting ourselves with the um, with the data we have access to. Um, so we have access to seven hosts, twenty four sources, and twenty two source types. Um, and this will this will load up in a second. Um, but track me, so, you know, being track me. Um, bro, so here's my goal. Eventually, is to actually get back to hosting my lab. It's going to be a hybrid lab. It's going to be like, um, it's going to have Windows, Linux, AWS, Azure, um, Kubernetes, all of it. And we're going to do like live simulations on them and investigate it within that lab rather than having to rely on like uh, track me to like, you know, do that. Cause like, it's just sometimes unstable. Um, so that's the, that's, that's my goal. Um, I have this um, course I'm, I want to go through that actually push you through building out your entire lab. And that's my goal to eventually do that. Um, not, so that I know that it's going to be reliable. Like it's my environment, it's my lab, um, it's hybrid. So we have like a, a, a wide range of like, you know, systems. And we can probably have like Teddy come break stuff in there or something. But yeah, so to orient ourselves with the data sources we have access to, um, we have access to uh, Suricata, um, some log files for um, the IS server, um, application logs for, the, uh, for Windows, uh, Sysmon, uh, security logs, system logs, um, uh, win registry logs. We have uh, these logs as well. I think, yeah, we have this one as well. I already said that. Um, hosts. So we have this host. We have that host. I believe this is the host that was compromised. Actually, no. I think this was the host that was compromised. We have Splunk. We have Suricata. We have a server, a desktop, and another server. In the source types, we have uh, these different source types um, for win event logs, the registry, Sysmon. Fortigate, Fortigate, IAS, and then a Nessus scan. I believe this is a, 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 a similar to, yeah, these scans right here. All right. Now let's get back into what we're doing. So our goal now was to investigate the action of objective. We do know that the attacker um, defaced the website, which we saw in the incident scenario. And our goal is to like track how that happened. Um, and what we're going to do in regards to get to that point is to um, start by looking at uh, the server kind of log source and the IP address is communicating with the web server, which you know is this uh, server right here, this IP address right here. So let's go ahead and copy that. And I'm going to go ahead and like just duplicate this because it's going to be over here. So that way we can just focus on our incident. You said because. So we can just focus on our incident. All right, let's go ahead and do this. And then we're going to make this search to be for all time, um, just because like this is a this data set is like pretty old. I'm going to go ahead and search that. And remember, we're looking for source IP addresses. All 
All right. So we've got a couple of results here. Still loaded, loaded up. Uh, let's wait. Let, let's wait a little bit more for it. All right. Let's just fully load it up. Uh, so we're going to be looking at the source. Um, so looking at this right here, and we can just you know, add it to selected like, fields as well. Uh, we see two IP addresses. And these are two internal IP addresses actually, um, and it does look like one of the IP addresses is the IP address of the server itself, the compromised server itself, and then another IP address which is this uh, 2.50. It seems like they're both in the same subnet, um, so it might make sense that they're communicating with each other. Um, makes sense. It might and might or might not make sense depending on like if two hosts should be communicating with each other. Um, I do imagine like in 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 a proper uh, network, like you wouldn't want like two different workstations communicating with each other. They should probably be communicating to the domain controller, um, but uh, the world is not perfect. Um, so these are two internal IP addresses. Um, so given that we don't see any external IP address communicating with the server, we can try to see if we are looking for, if we can find um, uh, data flow in the other direction. So right now we're looking for if any IP address is communicating to this internal IP address. Let's try to see if, we, if any IP address, if, if this internal IP address is communicating outbound to another IP address, right? So to explain that again, what we just looked for here is to try to find if um, our internal IP address is communicating to any, sorry, we're trying to look at if there are any external IP addresses communicating to our internal IP address. And we didn't see anything here. So let's try to see if the internal IP address is making any communications to an external IP address. And we can just simply do that by modifying this to a source. And wait for that to run again. And then we can now look at destination IP address here. So let's go ahead and scroll all the way down. And we see DST and let's make it a selected field. And we see a couple of interactions here. So we see um, I'm really not batman.com, which is the website I got defaced. We see the same IP address for that. We see um, a 71, the 39 IP address. We see a uh, Juma.org, which kind of makes sense because um, if you remember, the CMS, which is the content management system for the site, um, is on Joomla. Uh, we see just HTTP. We see prank glassing bracket the jumping crab .com. this is immediately suspicious to me um we see this right here which is also suspicious like a bunch of characters we see uh because like this is not even supposed to be an ip address right um, wait this is um top 10 values for destinations from the compromised machine yes, yes. exactly these are top 10 values And then we see this as well, which does seem like this is, so if we if we analyze this, it looks like the attacker probably tried to um, encode this as like a MD5 hash or something. I might be wrong, but like, that looks kind of weird. What do you think this payload look, what do you think this print payload is, Teddy? Print MD5, looks like something written in Python, honestly. Um, Acunetics. I have no idea what that is. It's, it's a lot of body scanner. Acunetics? Yes. Okay. So it's probably just bad Python code. I have no idea what this is. Gotcha. I mean, we could try to see what it is. Uh, let's ask ChatGPT what it is. Because it is interesting. Let's see, what is this? What is this payload uh, getting outbound? traffic from my internal server. Oh, so it's written in PHP. So it seems to be attending an MD5 function on the string Akinetics WVS security test and then print the result. Uh, however, this code alone doesn't necessarily indicate malicious activity. The MD5 function commonly used for, yeah. And printing the result may be a part of debugging or testing code. So just a web test, a, a test related to Akinetics web vulnerability scanner. Um, so it does seem like it's trying to encode this, like it's trying to not encode, it's trying to hash this as MD5 and then print it, um, uh, well, using PHP, which is quite interesting. Um, I wonder why someone want to do that, but obviously it, we know that the attacker was using the Akinetics web uh, scanner. We also have this NS lookup to TSIJYX, um, and then some more pretty weird stuff. So 
<clears throat> Going back to track mirror. So it says, what is interesting about that output? What is interesting about that output? Usually the web servers do not originate the traffic. The browser or the client would be the source and the server would be the destination. Here we see three external IPs, two words, which are web server initiates the outbound traffic. So it does look like we're just looking at destination. We're, we're supposed to be looking at a destination IP. Interesting. Okay, so these are IP addresses. So we, we do see uh, traffic towards this IP address, which we do know we've observed uh, from the initial attack, the initial brute force um, that was actually like the one that did the successful login. And this was the IP address that did the actual brute force. And then these are two internal IP addresses um, and then some other IP addresses here. So we see three IP addresses. It seems like this is not three IP addresses, it's two IP addresses. So these are two IP addresses that uh, the server initiates outbound traffic to. And there's a large chunk of traffic going towards these external IP addresses that will be worth checking. So let's go ahead and check uh, traffic towards these IP addresses. I kind of find that kind of interesting because I mean, we did we know that these IP addresses were, you know, part of the initial attack. I wonder why like that is not naturally inf inferred, but let's go ahead and, and, and look at what that looks like. So our, our well, we can just like click into the and just add it to the query for the first one or the second one. All right. And we're looking at the URL. Let's see. Uh, SD URL. So it says the URL shows two PHP files and one J one JPEG file. Okay, so let's let's contextualize this. Let's contextualize this a bit. So we see source and destination. So from the internal IP address to this destination IP address. We see a PHP file, another PHP file, and the JPEG file. I remember this JPEG file so, uh, looks like something we saw when we observed when we first got the incident, which is the you have been defaced, your site has been defaced, and that seems like this the name of the file here. So it is kind of weird though that it's like kind of backwards. So I think what we could do here, or I mean, what TrackMe is asking us to do here is to change the query and see where the JPEG come, came from. So let's go ahead and change this query to see where the JPEG came from. Um, so we're going to make this part of the query and then let's take this out. Actually, no, we're just gonna make this a destination IP address. Destination IP address. We're not using this sort of got a source here. Take that out. Uh, take this out as well. And then pipe this into a table. Wait, I'm a bit confused here. Um, which IP address is this? The destination IP. So this is the this is the server that was compromised. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we're seeing, we're trying to find out how this file got into it. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So pipe this into a table and then we want a column for time for the source, destination IP address and HTTP host name and URL. Okay, we have only one result for that. So. We see at 22, 19, 10, and 2016, uh, this IP address made a request to our internal IP address with this host name. And then this was the file that was part of that request. Very interesting. So we can confidently say that this IP address, which we do know was part of the brute force attack, was the one that actually uploaded or was the one that actually um i'm trying to refer this back to like the i believe the install installation phase because it does seem like there had to be a way by which this 
this uh, internal host pulled this file from that IP address. So I think that uh, file, that um, executable that we saw the last time, probably has something to do with this. That's my inference uh, from this. So basically, we, we, should, we, we can see that this file was basically downloaded from this uh, malicious, uh, malicious, malicious uh, uh, IP address here. So basically, probably when the attacker um, dropped that stager, part of whatever that stager did was download the IP address, or maybe they were able to use that stager to get initial access to the host, and then use that to download the IP, uh, to download this file that was then used to uh, deface uh, the website. And it does seem like this file was being hosted on this site, which is you know what this IP address is behind. Um, and then download it to the the host here. So that is what happened in the actions and objectives phase, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so we're in the action and objectives phase. So just to just to uh, kind of uh, uh, reframe what we just did, we actually wanted to find out how the website got defaced, and we started by looking at the uh, requests that were being made from the internal IP address to external IP addresses. Um, and we saw that um, from the source of that, uh, from the source of the internal host, um, there were not many requests being made. They were mostly made towards internal hosts, which might be a good or bad thing, depending on how you look at it. Probably a bad thing, uh, most likely a bad thing. But then when we flipped that and we looked for um, uh, uh, where where the internal host was making requests to an outbound IP address, we saw that. Um, well, when we flipped that. And we looked at when outbound IP addresses were making requests to the internal host, we observed that in this case, um, the way by which this file got onto the internal host was by pulling it from this IP address, which is hosting this website here, which we saw in our initial uh, query um, and was able to download it and then eventually used to deface the website. So that explains the action objectives. Your site has been defaced. All right. I honestly do not understand the point. The point. I mean, I understand like activists and all that, but you only defacing website. Then what? I mean, like, if it's an activist, then I guess that kind of makes sense as part of their objective. What you think? That also just depends on how much traffic goes to the website. Usually, the website that ends up getting defaced, or like certain companies is gonna be one that doesn't get a lot of traffic so no one's gonna see it anyway i i don't know like i imagine like if you want to like make a statement you probably deface a very popular website though but that's not always the case though it's not that simple is it no no of course it wouldn't be simple to just deface any website um but i i i, I mean I, I think anybody can get it like when it comes to defacement i imagine probably yeah all right so this is a question What's the name of the file that defaced the I'm really not Batman .com website? Um, it was this file. All right, paste it. Fortigate firewall detected SQL attempt. What is SQL attempt? It's like SQL injection attempt. Yeah, it's supposed to be SQL injection attempt from the attacker IP 40.80.148.42. What is the name of the rule that was triggered during the SQL injection attempt? All right, let's see. So we're looking for requests from this IP address. So let's grab that. So this is going to be uh, the source IP address. Um, so let's go ahead and just clear this out. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to say source source ip and equals to that ip address so we get here uh, we're looking for the 40 gate firewall source type so I, I have to actually specify that let's go back into events i should probably take this table out forgot what the value is uh source 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 type 40 gate UTM, I believe. Yeah. All right, let's oop. Let's use that as part of the query. And then all right. And then let's see. We're looking into URL, maybe. Yeah, definitely not URL. Let's see. Uh 
We're looking for the sequel injection. Yeah, which like you or I maybe. Or something that, that shows a request or something. Let me see. Yeah, it should be in the URL. Like at the at the end of the at the end of the URL, it should tell us. I would think so too. Yeah, it should be in the URL. So probably have to like make the URL like uh, look for something in the URL that has like uh let's see. Uh, was another oh the rule that was triggered during the sequel injection attempt. Let's try to let's try to see um URL equals something sequel. Because if it's a rule, then it probably will have like SQL in it. Let's see. URL. Okay, so you have a bunch of these. Okay, well, probably there's probably gonna be a rule, a rule. Um it's, there should be a rule uh field as well. Yeah, rule ID. Yeah. Uh let me do this. Let me let me take out that that because we're looking for the rule. Not because if the attacker is, is doing a SQL injection, like they wouldn't put like SQL in the URL. Um, it would be like a you know, try to give us an example of what, what it would look like in the URL. Probably an apostrophe to close out the query or parentheses. Just depends on the query type and what the database expects. But I would start by looking for a single quote, double quote, or open parentheses. Right. Right. That's what I would expect. Um, but we're looking for the rule, not like the payload here. So but yeah, I just I wanted to get more con I wanted I wanted you to give more context into like um what to expect if we're looking at uh, a SQL injection in the URL. All right. So I've added the rule as the as a uh field. Let's see. Twenty six. Uh let me see. Let me look into the raw um to the raw event to see if there's anything that could prove promising here, rule wise. All right, so we've got 80 event type file name, action, pass through, message. It belongs to an allowed category in public. Maybe the message, probably. That would tell us that. Let's see, anything else? Anything catch your eye, Teddy? I'm going to look into the messages, though. Isn't it supposed to show what rules get triggered in general? Yeah, yeah. that's, what I'm, so that's okay. what I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find what field contains what the rules that, that get triggered uh, for the FortiGate UTM. So let me see maybe the message field. Uh, message. Oh, okay. I think this is it. This is it. So yeah, I think this is yeah. These are these are, these are different rules. If you're familiar with like firewall rules, like they're sometimes they're kind of weird, like like that. But I think this is it. So you're uh, webmisc http uri dot sql injection. Let's grab that one. That's probably it, right? Yeah, that should be it. One hundred and ninety nine attempts. Yeah. Crazy. Um. Yeah. Hundred percent. So I think it's probably just looking for this part of it. Yeah, there we go. All right, so recap of what we just did. We investigated um, uh, using Splunk to find uh, requests that were being made uh, from external IP addresses to uh, the internal IP address uh, hosting our web server um, and also back and forth. And we were able to find that uh, the, uh, the web server downloaded a file uh, from the uh, from from the malicious server being hosted by the attacker uh, with that with that same IP address that we saw doing a brute force earlier on, um, and we said that was how the attacker downloaded that file that was used to deface the website. Now let's go into move on to the command and control phase. Uh, I think this is going to uh, be a very interesting one to see like what happened here, um, and it does seem like we're going to be dealing with some DNS here. So command and control: the attacker uploaded the file to the server before defacing it. So we just saw that. While doing so, the attacker used a dynamic DNS to resolve a malicious IP. Our objective would be to find the IP that the attacker decided the DNS. To investigate the communication to and from the adversary's IP address, we will be examin examining the network-centric log sources mentioned above. We'll first pick the FortiGate UTM to review the firewall logs and then move on to the other log sources. By the way, if you 
not for, if you're not familiar with network centric log sources, I definitely recommend um, watching the video I made about Sims um, and how they work. Uh, so there's network centric log sources. There's also host centric log sources, um, and they have different sort of artifacts within them that help you you with your investigations and your detections. Um, I'll drop a link to that video or actually to that playlist here because there's a couple of videos in there. By the way, on Monday I'm dropping a, a final video for the Sim series. But I definitely recommend checking that out. Let me drop that in the chat. Because we started with the Sim series just so that we can get a foundation for um, you know security operations and Sims. All right, but um so I'll definitely recommend checking those first before well, not before, but you know, to understand the uh, you know the, the network and host centric log sources. So we drop that right here. Uh, that's a playlist for the security security operations content. All right, so let's go ahead and get to searching. All right, close back up. All right, so now we're investigating command and control, um, and we we want to first investigate using the uh, network centric log sources. So. Let's start by clearing this out. And we're going to be using the FortiGate UTM log source. So there's that. Let's first see how many events we have for just the FortiGate UTM log source. Uh, again, I forget what UTM means. Is is it in universal threat monitoring? Last time I last time I, I got it wrong. Yeah, I got it wrong again. Unified threat monitoring. I can't keep up with these like acronyms, man. Like, cheese. Anyways, so uh, we have twenty five, almost twenty six thousand events for the UTM. Let's go ahead and so we're trying to find the command and control uh, activity, and our source of truth is we already know that the attacker was able to download this file that he used to um, deface the website. So we want to see what um, network centric artifacts are related to that file, IP address wise, that we can then use to trace back IP address we can use for further investigation. So since we know what that file was, let's actually go ahead and um, copy it right here, and that's going to be what we use as a, as a as a as a pivot for our investigation into the network log sources. You didn't miss much, Teddy. What are we looking for exactly? We're using the file that was used to deface the website to look for what exactly? Because now we're looking, we're looking, we're doing. Okay. It's very deep. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
unauthorized control. Bro, was your mic on? Their systems. Was it? Chat says no sound. Oh, oh dang! I, I did not. I did not turn on my computer. All right. So, so we're explaining com uh, command and control. My apologies. So. The term command and control originated in military and organizational contexts. In military terminology, command and control refers to the exercise of authority and direction by a designated commander over assigned forces in the accomplishment of a mission. It involves the use of communication, decision making, and coordination to achieve specific objectives. So basically, um, I imagine like after a um, after maybe a, a, a military. Um, expenditure or whatever what's the word a military campaign or whatever and maybe they've taken control over a region uh they, they basically centralize authority um over that region through command and control of some sort so basically in terms in the context of cybersecurity, um uh, it's adapted to describe the infrastructure and mechanisms used by the attacker to manage and control compromised computer systems or networks and this adaptation reflects a similarity in the hierarchical and centralized nature of control observed in both military operations and certain cyber attacks. So while the term has its roots in military terminology, it has been extended to describe a concept in the realm of cybersecurity, particularly in the context of malicious activities and unauthorized control of computer systems. So basically, uh, it's it's a it's a military borrowed borrow term, um, but obviously, like the the goal is to centralize um, uh, the structure between like when it, when an attacker is got in control over a system or, or a network, uh, being able to like control those systems or communicate back and forth, manage resources, um, further expand within the network. Like the command and control is like that centralized point for all of those operations uh, for the attacker. Do you want to explain command and control in your, in your, in your own context, Daddy? Um, command and control from what I know would be basically what you explained um, an attacker af after having compromised certain host or server, um, they use some sort of server to send commands and, you know, either escalate, um, horizontally in that same server or vertically within that same server or vertically or horizontally within the network. So they're basically using that as a command center since it has all the shell code um all the privilege escalation scripts um stuff to bypass edrs and avoid antivirus just it's usually best used for avoiding detection um yeah just to make less noise when you compromise a host yeah so like basically like you know like for example let's say the attacker excuse me the attacker drops a stager um, for like the initial compromise and they want to like download more resources or they want to, you know, do some reconnaissance uh, within a network, uh, they can do reconnaissance using like whatever they might, whatever kind of malware uh, within the environment and then use that um, to then send details back to their command and control server, uh, you know, basically, oh, you know, this is this operating system or maybe this is like what the network looks like. Um, and that could be very helpful as well. So yeah, command and control uh, or C2. All right, so our our query here has run, and we see only two requests here. And again, this is how 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 we're, we're able to find out it's it's simulated. So we see it's a demo zero one. That's a name of the host. Got him. All right. <laughs> so we see a get request from this IP address, our internal IP address, to uh, the jumping crab IP address. Uh, we see that request, and then. Yeah, another get request here, which is kind of interesting to get requests. But yeah, so we've kind of have validated, uh, you know, the domain that the attacker is using for uh, their command and control. Now we've only looked at HTTP and um, what else? And uh, the FortiGate firewall logs. The command and control a lot of times is done using DNS. Um, as a matter of fact, sometimes attackers actually use uh, their command and control server as a, a destination for exfiltration so um uh like exfiltration over dns so basically they can like uh steal information you know like i say files and then like just basically send that information from the internal server over dns to their command and control server so let's say the attacker's um objective here was to steal information and then um exfiltrate that information to their own server whatever the case may be they could have done this over dns so it, it would make sense if we do look at dns based uh logs so let's go ahead and 
change this because we do have access to uh, a DNS stream as well. Uh, let's see what that what, what that might look like. This is actually one of the fun things I enjoyed about uh, the um, certified Cyber Defender from Cyber Defenders. Uh, part of the labs that you do actually goes over a DNS exfiltration. Um, I believe that's how that works. Uh, is that a wrong query? Stream DNS. Let's see. Maybe we should. Oh, we might, might not find that um, in the DNS log. So let's take that out. All right. Let's do just this for that. Maybe. Oh, uh, what am I missing? Let me take that out as well. Let's just do all the DNS logs. Okay. Okay, we have about 7,000 7, DNS requests. Let's look at uh, source and destination IP addresses for more filtering. I'm actually curious to see what DNS requests are here. So source IP, here, source IP. Uh, let's make the source IP to be our compromised host, which is this one. And then let's run that. And then let's make the destination IP address to be, come on, come on, come on. My goodness gracious, this is kind of slow. Uh, oh my goodness. To be, dude, it's actually very buggy. Uh, what's the destination IP? Okay, right here, we have it right here. Uh, please, please, please load, please, oh no. Let's go back up. Patience. All right. Do you guys also see how this is slow? Like on the stream, like the VM is like so so. All right. Um, and we see a request to this. This is a new IP address. Interesting. I wonder what that looks like. Very interesting. And let's see. I, f I imagine if we could see like the actual DNS requests. In there, let's see. Uh, message type, a uh, query, a DNS query. Oh, come on, please. You know what? I'm just gonna add it as, as a field um, on this side. Oh, this is just me, just it just got slower all of a sudden. Like, it's taking seconds to like load. Okay, 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 please, 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 please. Okay, query. I want to see what queries are here. Oh my goodness. All right, let me read this. Bro, page. what? What the difference? It's so slow. It's so slow, bro. Try hack me. Please say I didn't break it. You might have just broken it. I couldn't have broken it. Doesn't the thing die after like an hour? Oh, stop. Don't tell me that. Like Refresh this page. Yeah, we still have like a, we still have, we still have some time. Okay. Dude. Okay, we're back. Show split view. View on full screen. All right, and then exit split view. Okay. Well, I mean, like, Trevi has, like, over a million users now, so we're just, like, efficient upon. Bro, how do you get a million users for a product? Provide free training. All right, let's go to query type. Uh, this is a NSA queries. Uh, query message type. Query. Well, I don't see what the DNS request is. Uh, and when the DNS request is typically in the query details, message type. Just query. I said tap. Well, I think this is what we're looking for. So let's take out the destination IP address. Actually, let's take out the source IP, the destination IP address we have right here. All right. So destination IP to, how is it? Just a top 10. Maybe to, to the, nope, none of that. 
source IP. No, destination IP. I'm trying to validate something here. You know what? Let's do this. Let's let's pipe this into a table, um, and see the request. I feel like there's something missing in this DNS request. Not they're not missing, but like I'm not seeing what I want to see. So let's look at uh, destination IP. Well, I want to start from like source IP, um, and then I want to see. Um, I want to also see, let's see, host name. I want to see the host name. Yeah, I want to see the host name as well. Source IP, host name. Um, I want to see destination IP as well. What else can I, can I, can I look into? Let's see what, what is in there first. Okay, let's look for when there's something in the host name. Host name. Host name. I'm just trying to look at what is in the DNS logs because I mean there has to be something in the DNS logs. Okay. Apparently, that was not the right query to use. All right, let's do this from the bottom. Let's do this maybe. Oh, what if I'm not using the right host name field? Oh, goodness gracious. Yeah, I am using the right host name field. Host name. Oh, so like it's a, yeah, it's an interesting like, oh, it's a nested value. Okay. Anyways, uh, I'll see a bunch of host names. Cardo Micro. I really do want to see like DNS requests being made to that uh ip address let me let me let me try to do destination ip is that ip address that we know so let me see if i can grab it from here maybe uh uh destination ip address yeah grab this and i want to see dest ip is that so no dns requests are made to that ip address that's very interesting are you serious about that let me do this and let me see uh, source type. Very interesting. So there were no DNS requests made to that address. So, okay, I thought it was going crazy or something. Very interesting. I do. I do wonder like what the other IP addresses are, are doing. But well, apparently no DNS requests were made. However, we do know that uh, the actual uh, domain that's behind this uh, malicious IP address is this domain right here. Uh, so if we do want to like, well, we could actually probably just. Use that as like a part of the query. Uh, so we could probably just say uh, uh, source type. Let's take this out. And source type is source type is DNS. And then let's just use that as a query for that. And then just do come right here and then run that okay there we go so there were requests made to that and that was made to oh 8.8.8 .8 .8. interesting that was the destination ip address that is the google uh dns ip address if i'm not if i'm not if i'm not if i'm not mistaken it's google yeah, yeah. So, so it, it looks, looks like, like the query this is a query to that uh, destination domain. Message type was just query. Query type was just this is an AA record. So this really, there was really like nothing uh, spectacular, I guess, about the requests that are made. And it was just three requests. Let's see what the second request was. So this was the response or the reply. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So this is the host address, which is you know what we know is uh, the compromised IP. Well, is the Perpetuating an IP address. So the way DNS works is you make a request to the DNS server, the DNS server then responds back to you. So this is what we've seen here, which is like the response and a reply code. And then we see another query again here, um, right here. So, I mean, if we follow this timestamps, this is 10, 11, 30, 429. So that was the request was being made and then a response was made uh, at 10, 06. Okay, yeah, that's inverted. So let's actually, 
uh, well, let's we're, we're from the bottom top. So this was the first. This was a request that was being made, a query that was being made to this domain from the compromised IP address to 8.8.8. .8 so I wonder if. So this is actually very interesting because if it was making a request to 8.8.8 .8 and it was resolving to this, that probably means that the host is compromised, right? It, it, it means that probably someone changed like the host, like the uh, internal DNS resolution for the file. What do you think, Teddy? If, 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 it, if, it's, if it's resolving to 8.8.8, .8, if it's resolving this domain for 8.8.8, .8 .8, which is obviously like Google's like, um, you know, DNS, right? 8.8.8.8 DNS. It's for Google's public DNS. So if it's resolving this domain to Google's public DNS, then it probably means that the, the host itself, something something was modified for that to happen. Because you can do that. Yeah. Host, right? It would have been the Etsy host file. You can make the 8.8.8.2, whatever domain you want. It's just like how you can change localhost to point to your own domain. Yeah. So that happened some somewhere. Like if, if we wanted to see how that happened, we we'll probably have to look into like the the host logs. But that was kind of interesting to find um, because it, it, it that was the first request, and then the response was um, this host address, and then uh, you know this domain was what it resolved to, and then there's another request. So that's kind of that's actually very interesting. Um, I didn't expect to discover that. Um, but to answer the question that we have for command and control here, um, this. What is the DNS? Um, I believe it was that one that we just saw. So let's just grab it. All right, we're almost done here. Are you reading the chat, bro? Am I reading the chat? Yeah. I need to go read the chat. I should go read the chat. All right, let's, let's take a quick break before we go into the last two phases to look at what's going on in the chat. All right, uh, I was like, I lost my audio for a bit, but we're back now. Yeah, it was good. Yes, nice of you to join us. So you gotta get a VS stream set up, get way better screen quality for these demos. Yeah, what do you think, Teddy? OBS next time? Yeah, I'll probably be using OBS as well. I mean, that's what I already use for um, recording my videos. Yeah, I'm gonna use OBS for recording, but like, why do I, I guess you can do a, use OBS for like multi streams from like um, uh, to LinkedIn. You just have to, I just have to set it up for it to do all of that. But I'm using StreamYard just because like it's like way more convenient um, to get it out there. But I do think OBS would probably be a better because OBS also does like you know um, it also does uh, local recording automatically. So I have to figure out how to set that up because um, StreamYard just makes it so much easier. But yeah, looks bad on their 32 inch Samsung. That is crazy. <laughs> 4K? Oh my goodness. Yeah, dang. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, we gotta fix that. That's bad. That was stream yard. Yeah. What's up, yo? Yeah, we've got we've got OBS in the building. Monster from OBS? Yeah, I have to you know, I might have to just take the opportunity to like figure out that setup of OBS and everything. Uh, man. Yeah, it's all right. You're right. You're right. Uh, man, I'm actually surprised because I thought I was getting like HD 1080p or something like that, but <laughs> apparently uh, not, bro. Yeah, but yeah, let's finish this up. Oh, uh, so we're getting echo again, but let me get back on. All right, oh, wrong thing. All right, we should be good now. All right, so let's get into the weaponization phase. All right, so in the weaponization phase, the adversaries would create malware or malicious document to gain initial access or evade detection. Uh, they also establish domains similar to the target domain to trick users. They create a command and control server for the post exploitation or communication activity. And now we found some domains and IP addresses associated with the attacker during the investigations. This task would mainly look into OSINT sites to see what more information we can get about the adversary. So far, we've found a domain, which is this domain we saw uh, in a previous for command and control uh, that was associated with the attack. 
uh, our first task would be to find the IP address that is tied to the domain that may potentially be pre-staged to attack Win Enterprises. In the following exercise, we'll be searching the online threat intel sites for any information like IP addresses, domains, email addresses associated with this domain, which could help us know more about this adversary. So we looks like we're just going to do some, some OSINT, all right? All right, all right, all right, all right. Yo, Teddy, how much OSINT do you do for, for your job? Zero. Bro, my job, I work in application security, so I literally have as much access to developers as I need to have. So anything I don't know, I will have an answer. So I'm not like shooting in the dark. So that's what people say is the best way to cover everything you need to do. Uh, so yeah, I don't, I haven't really done too many black box tests, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I imagine that if you're doing um like actual like network penetration tests and stuff like that, we have to like maybe social engineer attacks to uh, social engineer users to get initial access. You probably might have to do like some OSINT and stuff like that. I think, I think social engineering would only be in scope for like a routine engagement. Not even external tests have social engineering in scope. Really? I must have been mistaken about that then. Yeah, yeah people don't like social engineering. It's, it's pretty yeah. difficult unless you have like a phishing campaign that's set up as part of the test. Then maybe, but that's usually not the case. Got you. That makes sense. All right, let's get back into this. Uh, we're going to start doing some um, OSINT about this domain, uh, starting with Robtex. Robtex is a threat intel site that provides information about IP addresses, domain names, and so on. Please search for the domain on the Robtex site and see what we get. We'll get the IP address associated with this domain. So let's go ahead and look up that domain on Robtex. This is actually my first time learning about Robtex. I've never heard of Robtex before. Interesting. I think I'm going to add it to my to my toolkit. I mean, I, not that I think. I am going to add it to my toolkit. All right. Okay. So, okay. So we see the fully qualified domain name, the actual host name, the domain name. Uh, it's a .com, TLD. The name servers are afraid.org. And then mail server is mail server is mail the jump in the crab. And then IP address is these IP addresses. Very interesting. I don't think we saw any of these IP addresses in during our investigations, but we could actually take this back as like indicators of compromise and use it like for like threat hunts to see if we are making any more requests to this IP addresses, um, just in case. All right. What else do we, what else do we have? Uh reverse. Reports of the query and related entities, SEO, what, Alexa, um, what else? So there's some subdomains, siblings, threat miner shared. So siblings, so siblings are domains that are, are host names on the same level, under the same parent level, not necessarily related in any other way. Very interesting. So, well, si well siblings are basically subdomains, right? I mean, this is a subdomain. Adj Adjazad, easy there, Lev, Megum, no, yeah. And we have graph history. Okay, this is interesting. Um, what are we looking at next? So it says some domains or subdomains associated with this domain. We already see that. Um, and then next, we're looking for the IP address. So we do know this is our perpetrating IP address. Let's go ahead and look that up. I'm going to leave this open. I'm just going to like duplicate this. Um, and then scroll back up and then dude, what the heck? All right. And then we're going to throw this in here and then look it up. All right. So what do we see? Uh, this section shows a quick analysis of the given host IP address. It looks like this is hosted in Amazon EC2. Um, hmm. well, it's, it's EC2. So we'll probably just see like where it might probably be. Um, let's see, threat miner. Okay, so we see what hosts might be using it. So we see WinCorp Incorporated is using this IP address, and we see different variations of WinCorp Inc. So WinCorp Inc., Wayne Ecor Inc. Oh, interesting. So we see different variations of uh, WinCorp using that IP address as uh, 
you know, for what they're hosting. So it does seem it, it does seem similar to Wayne Corp, but it seems like there are other IP addresses hosted. Uh, there are other um, domains that are yeah. So what I'm trying to explain here is this is the attacker's malicious IP address, right? And it seems like they've registered a bunch of domains that could be easily um is the word typo squatted um for win win corp in a sense that this is w a n e c o r p i n c but it's not the same way win corp is actually spelt so it does seem like they're trying to like maybe they, they could use this for social engineering they could use this for like uh type squatting um whatever the case may be so yeah what do you think about this teddy the official term is typo squatting I did not actually know that, but that's probably the case. Just have someone type mistakenly and then take them to your domain. Perfect. Yeah. Well, they could use it like an efficient attack where like they just send them like the link and it looks so similar to like the actual link. I just like click it. If, you're not, if they're not, if they're not being uh, attentive, someone said pre prepended. Interesting. I literally passed a phishing test today. For one of my clients, <laughs> it, was, it was that was difficult. I'm not gonna lie, that looked so legit. Congrats, man! Congrats, bro. All right, so next one, what we're gonna look at, uh, but yeah, we kind of see like there's an intent here with uh trying to register a domain similar to Win Enterprise. Uh, virus total, uh, so we know about virus total. Let's search for the IP address on virus total, um, and go into the relations tab. All right, let's do that. I'll start the IP address. I can probably hear that in my mic. And it says, if we go to the relations tab, we can see all the domains associated with this IP address, which looks similar to Wayne Enterprise. So relations, okay, okay. So we see even more. So again, uh, even poisonivy.com, www.poisonivy.com, some malicious files as well that have been scanned. It's communicating with these files. Miranda Tate, screensaver. Interesting. But yeah, a bunch of really interesting things in the relations here. But I guess this is part of the old things we're doing. We're looking at communications. We're looking at DNS uh, resolution. We're looking at communi communicating files, files referring um historical who is lookups and then also a nice graph summary here i don't believe you have to sign in to actually get details about these resolutions but more OSINT there uh using virus total so yeah so we see poisonivy.com so we can actually go ahead and private to another search for poisonivy.com so let's go ahead and grab that um oh, okay we just like open this in a new page yeah and basically this says it's clean. Details. Last HTTP certificate. Who is lookup activity? All of the stuff is redacted. It's in the Netherlands. Interesting. There should be more stuff, maybe like files and stuff. Oh, relations, maybe. Okay, so we see like passive DNS re replication. Siblings. We see some interesting subdomains as well. FTP. Ilian, so maybe FTP for like file hosting uh, or file transfers, maybe SMTP, some files or a file, ketap.pdf. Interesting. Community, <laughs> everyone's saying bots, bots v1. That's funny. All right, what we'll do next? Uh, next, we're going to look at the who is information for poisonivy.com using domain tools. This just reminds me so much of my suck tail of my suck suck days. How many investigations would you do in like a day? Or did you have like a set number of investigations you had to do in a week? Uh I just spent enough time to like have to deal with like being um like having quotas for my investigations. But I would say like in a day. I was probably doing like, well, because I was doing the false positives, I'm probably doing like 20 to 30. And trust me, there's like probably like three or four out of those are like deep dive investigations back then. Um, 
and then the rest are just all false positives. Um, most of the times, you you have an SLA to like finish an investigation within a couple of minutes, well, within like thirty minutes and one hour, depending on severity, like maybe a bit longer. Um, but a lot of times, like you know, you if if there's something that's like actually malicious, we actually just like uh, escalate to um, uh, to the incident response team uh, back then. So for a tier one, you're probably not going to be spending much time because you're going to be doing like just initial triage, get details together, uh, putting some notes. And if it's a false positive, you close it out. If it's not, you escalate to tier two or you escalate your directly to instant response. If you identify a actual true positive that is malicious, if you want to escalate to tier two, maybe that's because you don't really understand what's going on and you maybe need some more context before you escalate to IR. Uh, but that was what it was. So I would say average of like, it's like 25 a day. So who gets like the credit if there's an actual incident? Like if you're SOC 1 and you escalate to IR? Honestly, I would say it's sort of a a, a thankless job in a sense. Um, like, because it's like, I don't know, like, I don't know how people feel, people feel about saying, oh, kudos to you for finding this bad thing. You know what I mean? Um, because it was an alert that came in and you, the bad thing happened inevitably. So <laughs> you kind of were doing your job. I never really found it. I, I found it was mostly a thankless job, to be honest. Fair, fair enough. Yeah, I think on the on the Blue Team side, it's, it's mostly a thankless job. Sadly. Yeah. All right, let's get back into what we're doing here. Uh, so we're looking at the who is record for this. Um, and we see Poison Ivy is actually hosted in Cloudflare. Interesting. I love Cloudflare. Um, and we see a bunch of things about it. Um, so it's in Hong Kong. Hmm, okay. It is registered and there's no website. Maybe it was taken down. Uh, 17 changes. There's different histories for it. So probably like, it's actually a really cool one because I'm, I'm making a video on uh, the Pyramid of Pain. It's a very long video, but basically IP addresses are very easy and trivial indicators. So it's easy for an attacker to basically change their IP address. So it's not a good way by which you can block them or like detect them because like it's very easy for them to change. Domain, domain names are like a, a level above that because like you have to like re-register the domains we can change the IP addresses, which is like a lot faster. So you're probably seeing like, you know, a lot of different IP addresses here for the same domain. Um, maybe through like um, redirection or maybe through like host actual hosting uh, for the domain. Um, because maybe if they're if they're discovered, they can easily just change that indicator, uh, but still maintain the same domain, right? Because it's it's more difficult to like register a new domain. Uh, every single time, like you have to get a paper to register, you gotta um, set it up, you gotta wait for the propagation. Like it takes like I think like twenty four to forty eight hours and all of that. So yeah, this could be the reason why there's like a bunch of IP addresses because they probably just kept the domain, but not the IP addresses. And we can actually just see screenshot history. It does look like a a Chinese. I mean, obviously it says it was hosted in Hong Kong, so um, this was like uh, some Chinese on on there. Ugh, though we're not doing this. I have an account, but we're not doing that. But yeah, so we 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 already know this is like you know obviously like very malicious poison ivy. All right, so we've got some details about what happened here. Uh, well, not what happened here. We've got some open source details about uh this IP address and you know what it does and all of those things. Uh, the different things is hosting, uh, communications and all of those things. Now let's answer the question here: What IP address has poison ivy tied to domains that are pre-staged? to attack Win Enterprises. We do know that this IP address has its connections to various domains that are pre-staged to attack Win Enterprises. I don't think it's to attack Win Inter Enterprises. I think it's more to um, impersonate Win Enterprises, uh, more to say, but it's the, 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 words, the wordings could be different. Based on the data gathered from this attack and common open source intelligence sources for domain names, what is the email address that is most likely associated with the Poison IV APT group? Let's go ahead and see. Maybe here we can find it in um, in the Whois record. So let's see. Maybe somewhere in here. Let's see if we can find an at. Let me find an at here. Maybe in here. 
Huh. Probably would be in here. There's no at here. Reseller, I've used contact. I don't think this is what it is. Oh, maybe uh, at. Hmm. So we're looking for the uh, output source, the target source domain. What is the IP address likely associated with the poison IV APT group? Hmm. So we don't have the details about their registration here. It's all redacted for privacy. I think you're going to have to put it together. I don't think there's an actual email address listed. I think, do you think I'm what? I said, I think you're going to have to put it together. I don't think there's an actual email address that's listed. Huh. You get what I mean? I think I just don't like what you're like saying. Is waynecorp.com I think that's like too far of a guess something like that yeah so this is a good uh, come on open source come on open source intelligence sources for domain names well I mean like I mean let's let's look at let's look at details for the domain name right um so I don't see anything for it be virus total uh Relation. I don't see any domain names here. We see a couple of files, but no, no emails, email details, details. It's the siblings. Siblings. Let's see the siblings. Oh, SMTP. Maybe SMTP details. If I something. So. Oh, okay. So register email. Two one four four, huh? But this is just like a half of it. It seems like two. Mm, 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 mm. Oh, maybe this is maybe maybe it's gonna be that. I'm thinking maybe it's gonna be this at poisonivy.com. Maybe. At, let me grab. This is kind of a wild guess. Let's see. Uh, hilarious. Let's see what the thingy looks like. What thing? What the answer is supposed to look like? Is it supposed to have the at symbol? It doesn't say. Yeah, it doesn't have an at symbol. It's just like dot dot. So there's there's dots in it. You know what? Let's 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 do a broader open source search. Oh, road tax has some details. I don't think this is part of what I'm looking for. Nope. Or we just go to road tax directly and search for that domain. Maybe it has details about it. You know what? I'm going to do two things here. I'm going to close this out. I'm going to duplicate this and go ahead and search for them here. I'm just gonna do, I'm also gonna just like a global Google search for them. Uh, actually, let me see this here first. What, Alexa, threat miner. Okay, I see a couple of things here. No email though. Well, that's DNSBL. Graph. All right, let's do a general Google search for that. Huh. Lillian, Lillian Rose? Rose? Did we see a name? Lillian Rose? Huh. That's an interesting one. It could be Lillian Rose. What did we see that from? Huh? What did we see that from? Did we I didn't. See that? I didn't. We never saw that. But it does seem like it's related. They're related some in some way. So, bro, I'm talking. My mic's not even on. <laughs> okay, so we do see that. Who owned it in the past? Lillian Rose. So it it, it has to be Lillian Rose. 
Yeah. It should be Lily, Lily and Rose. That's the power of a... See that? That's the power of a, of a Google search. So, yeah. It was Lily and Rose. Very interesting. <laughs> that sounds, like, so fictitious. That, like, sounds, like, so unreal. All right. We're in the last phase. We're in the last phase now. All right. So, we've gone through every single phase from start to finish. Uh, we went through reconnaissance. Um, let's go over it. We went over... Reconnaissance, exploitation, installation, action on objectives, command and control, weaponization, and now we're in the delivery phase. So in the delivery phase, the attackers quit malware and infect devices to gain initial access or evade defenses and find ways to deliver it through different means. We have identified various IP addresses, domains, and email addresses associated with this adversary. Our task for this lesson would be to use the information we have about the adversary and use various threat hunting platforms and OSINT sites to find any malware linked with the adversary. Third Intel reports suggested that this adversary group Poison IV appears to have a secondary attack vector in case the initial compromise fails. Our objective would be to understand more about the attacker and their methodology and correlate the information found in the logs with various threat intel sources. And we're going to use three OSINT sites. One is going to be virus total. Second one will be threat miner. And the third one will be hybrid analysis. If you've worked in a SOC environment or as a security analyst, you're probably familiar with all of these uh, different sites. So we're going to start with our, we're going to start our investigation by looking for the IP in threat miner. Let's grab that and open that in threat miner. Okay. All right, so, oh, it, oh, it automatically opened it. So here in Threat Miner, what are we looking for? So we see the host, geolocation, APT notes, interesting, passive DNS, associated DNS, malware samples. Oh, very interesting. So we see there are different malware samples associated with this file. Um, so we see the MD5 hashes. This one, there are no detections. This one, there are no detections. Excuse me. Uh, this one, there are detections for it. So we see Trojan, Trojan, Trojan by different antivirus systems. Backdoor, Trojan, all the way down. Let's see. Let's go ahead and click into this and see where it leads us to. Okay, so the file name is mirandatatescreensaver.scr.exe. I remember we actually saw this um, in our virus little search earlier on, if I'm not mistaken, uh, somewhere as a file related to this. Yeah, so right here, communicating file. So that, that is actually not surprising. Um, so the file size, all that fun stuff. So yeah, this basically gives us details about possible malicious files that are associated with this uh, particular um, malicious uh, IP address. Let's go on then to look into virus total. So open virus total and search for the hash on virus total now and I can get more information about the metadata about this malware. Let's go ahead and do that. So I guess we can we can pivot from threat miner with that hash that we know has detections into virus total and search that hash. And we see that it's flagged as malicious by 52 out of 71 vendors uh, for various things. So whether it's like malware, uh, backdoor, uh, uh, Trojan, whatever the case is, uh, details. You see the file hash, things about it. It's a Windows 32 executable. Um, what else can we see about it? Different imports, different exports. It just basically screams bad. Like this are these domains, register to GoDaddy. I wonder if, if, if there's anything that actually could point it back to poisonivy.net. Since we know that poisonivy.net is like a oh, poisonivy.com, sorry. Um, I don't see anything that's pointing it back to poisonivy.com. Let's actually see what the community is saying about it. Everyone's saying Splunk and butts, butts of the sock. Well, if you if you ever see like Thor or like Yara, just know like, yeah, this is definitely something that you want to be uh, pay some attention to because uh, like they completely comment uh, their details about it. Uh, by the way, this is like Thor, which is a uh, 
uh, built by Florian Roth, uh, the guy that built Sigma, uh, and yeah, basically a bunch of like detection stuff. All right, so we've looked at this and virus total. I, I would have loved if, I, if there was a way that this actually pointed back to poisonivy.net, um, but it does seem like you know, it's it's not through it's not it's not it doesn't directly correlate at least from the results that are that are shown here in in, uh, in virus total. But we do know like it, it does have something to do with that with that APT. Next, we have hybrid analysis. Hybrid analysis is a beneficial site that shows the behavior analysis of any malware. And you can look at the, all the activities performed by this malware after being executed. Some of the information you can find is the network communication, DNS requests, contacted hosts with country mapping, strings, minor attack mapping, uh, malicious indicators, DLL imports and exports, USX information if created, and file metadata and screenshots. This basically does, this is like a uh, virus total on steroids basically. So let's go ahead and go to hybrid analysis here. Well, we have to, I guess, look for that ourselves. And we're just gonna paste that hash that we have here again. Uh, let me search for hash, follow your report search. String search? Oh, this is hex ASCII string. Uh, report search. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so so this is the same hash for Bounty something something and then Miranda Tate. Obviously, we do know like what we previously saw was Miranda Tate. Uh, let's check out what it says about Miranda Tate first. Uh, so basically, no behavior. It contacts one host, which is this IP address, which we do know about, uh, which was the perpetrator. And then uh, for MITRE techniques detections, it has seven attack techniques and six tactics. Let's look at that. So it does defense evasion, uh, basically software packing or virtual machine software protection to conceal their code, uh, credential access and collection. So it may, uh, adversaries may hook it to Windows uh, API to collect user credentials, discovery, Adversary may attempt to get detailed information about the operating system and hardware and all the other stuff, more discovery stuff for the query registry. So it's basically getting registry information about the software installed, system configuration, all that stuff. Uh, collection, command and control, impact. So it's basically doing a bunch of things that you would expect from malware, essentially. All right, so we've seen that. Indicators, uh, samples identified as malicious for there's antivirus systems, we already saw that. Uh, suspicious indicators, we see uh, found a cryptographic related string. Let's see what that looks like. Details, DES, source file, memory, relevance, 10 out of 10, attack ID, T1486. We could go look at that in the MITRE attack matrix of one or two. General sends out UDP traffic. So these are different indicators that hybrid analysis is using to determine um, and you know, basically say, oh, this is this is malicious, right? So, you to be connection to this IP address, which we already know, uh, persistence, uh, these behaviors, a bunch of other things, basically, uh, informative, some um, anti-reverse engineering behaviors, uh, environment awareness. So this is what malware would do to kind of understand where it is uh, before you know going out to do whatever it needs to do. Uh, and we have more details about the file. Uh, it's a executable. File metadata, file sections, file resources. So it basically gives us a really good digest of like what this file is doing, which you know helps us understand that this is malicious and why it is malicious as well. Do you do any malware analysis or reverse engineering? Is that part of your role? Currently, no. None of my current role. At what point would you be doing that? Would you are there people in IR that do that? or is that like a whole different team or something? So typically when it comes to malware analysis and reverse engineering, they're typically specialized roles for that. And it says that within a SOC, they're like, so it could be a skill that a tier three, tier four, or tier five might have, or there might be a specialized person for that in the SOC or in the MSSB or in the security org that basically their job is to just mal analyze malware. But we typically find that in either extremely larger enterprises uh, extremely specialized teams or specific kind of like security operations companies, like let's say like a company like Huntress or a company like 
um, like MSSP or MD MDR, uh, where like they have to deal with like various incidents and need someone on deck who can always analyze malware or reverse engineer uh, malware. Um, but it's it, it's either a specialized skill or a skill that somebody at a higher level or higher tier a higher tier would have. Okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and the goal is like basically to understand how the memory works and then also use those indicators to view detections uh, for that as well. All right, so let's go ahead and answer the questions here. What is the hash of the malware associated with the AVT group? Uh, I think we already got that, which is this. What is the name of the malware associated with the poison IV infrastructure? Then we got it. It's the something something Tate uh, screensaver or something like that. Yeah, Miranda okay. Tate screen. Yeah. Pop G. This is from like 20, 20 what? 2016, bro. They were ahead of the time. <laughs> That's hilarious. All right. Okay. So we're done with that. So we've kind of basically dissected the attacker's activities across the cyber kill chain. All right. Conclusion. In these fun exercises, as a SUC analyst, all of us, myself, you, and of course, Teddy, who joined us today, uh, we investigated a cyber attack where the attacker one sock analyst. You said what? Said I'm a tier one sock analyst now. Hilarious. We investigated a cyber attack where the attacker had defaced a website uh, called I'm really not Batman.com for Win Enterprise. We mapped the attacker's activities into the seven phases of the cyber kill chain. Let's go ahead and recap what happened, what happened so far. In the reconnaissance phase, we first looked at any reconnaissance activity from the attacker to identify the IP addresses and other details about the adversary. We found that the IP address 40.80.148.42 was found to be scanning our web server, and the attacker was using a Acunetics vulnerability scanner as a web scanner. Next, we have the exploitation phase. We then looked into the traces of exploitation attempts and found brute force attacks against our server, which were successful. The brute force attacks actually originated from the 23.22.63.114 IP address. Now, the IP address that was used to get access was the 40.80.148.42 IP address. 142 unique brute force attempts were made against the server, out of which one was successful, which was the one from 40.80.148.42, whereas the brute force attacks all came from 23.22.63.144. Next, we have the installation phase. Here we looked at all the here we looked at all executables that came from the attacker's IP address that was uploaded to our servers. We found that there was a malicious executable called 3791.exe uh, that was uploaded by the attacker. We then looked at the sysmon logs and found the MD5 hash of the file. Moving on to the actions and ob objectives, after compromising the web server, the attacker defaced the website and basically uploaded a picture saying your, your website has been defaced. And we examined the logs and found the file that was used to deface the web server. After that, we moved on to the weaponization phase where we use various threat intel platforms to find the attacker's infrastructure based on the following information we saw in the above activities. So we did know that, so we knew that the domain that was used was the pranking glass in bracket, the jumping crab .com domain, which was hosted under the IP address 23.22, the 63.144, uh, which we do know was the perpetrator. And then we also found behind this domain, uh, we also found multiple domains that were masquerading domains uh, under the attacker's IP address. We also found a very interesting email, which was lillian.rose at poisonivy.com, which is also associated with the attacker's IP address. Moving on to the final phase, which was the delivery phase, here again, we leveraged some open source intelligence using some online threat intel sites to find the malware that was actually associated with the adversary's IP address. Uh, so we used VirusTotal, we used ThreatMiner, and we used hybrid analysis uh, to find the secondary attack vector um, just in case the initial compromise failed. And we saw that the malware uh, was named Miranda Tate screensaver.scr.exe, uh, and it was associated with the adversary. And we also found the file hash, which is the MD5 hash of that particular file. And that essentially concludes everything that we just did from start to finish. It's like a, a clapping like uh, sound effect here, but that was fun. That took us two, 
live streams and four hours to go through, Crazy. four plus hours to go through. Uh, but we basically investigated this uh, from start to finish. Uh, we learned a lot about Splunk, learned a lot about investigating, learned about a lot about using DNS logs, HTTP logs, firewall logs, uh, Windows event logs, a bunch of things. That was exciting. Thank you guys so much for joining these streams. Uh, it's a little late now. It's 10.15. But I appreciate you guys coming in, joining the streams, um, going over these investigations with us, um, and learning about Splunk. Uh, it's been very fun. This is our fourth consecutive stream so far. Uh, hoping to continue this as long as possible. And also shout out to Taddy for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you everyone for joining and helping us stumble through. We can find, what were you looking for? The email? <laughs> the email? <laughs> that was the only thing you found? <laughs> the email? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, shout out to Taddy for joining us and kind of uh, giving us his perspective as a, uh, a, a, a someone who works on the offensive side of things. Because uh, always, it's always good to have the perspective, especially when we're doing like uh, threat hunting or investigations. Because um, on the defensive side, we have you know such amount of knowledge that is more focused on our investigation. Uh, but having an offensive perspective help helps us understand like the mind of the attacker, what they're doing, and stuff like that. So thanks to Teddy for joining us today. But thanks to you guys for joining the stream. Uh, for anyone who is wondering, uh, this is going to be available um, on the live section of the uh, YouTube channel for probably a couple of months or weeks until we're able to gather the files for this and edit it uh, and make it an actual video. So definitely, you know, keep an eye out for it. It'll be there. Uh, but yeah, thank you guys so much for joining the stream. By the way, let's go into the, let's, let's look into the, to the chat and see what's, what's been happening for a minute before we, we, we end the live stream. There wasn't much happening in the chat, honestly. Everyone was just, yeah. Um, we got Partha, just, Partha know. pulling out to my stream. What's good, Partha? How are you doing? Shout out to Partha, man. Partha's a go. He's really go. What does he do? I don't know, Potter. He's a senior product manager at Datadog. Bro. He does like security stuff for products at Datadog. Shout out to Partha, man. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate you, Partha, for pulling up to the stream. I uh, also got, um, uh, let's see here, seeing how they compare to Hulu's site. Prepend, I believe this came in when we were looking at uh, type of squatting. I believe that was what we were trying to discover whether it was type of an attack. <laughs> this guy said, "Forest total number one two for second." <laughs> That's such a like, it's such a dig, but also like so true. But yeah, true. We can use tools like DNS Twist to query for common typos for a given domain. Uh, previous, uh, I was I had it automatically search service. Oh, that's actually really cool. It's like a tool that already does that. I'm gonna add it to my tool list. DNS Twist. Cool stuff. Thanks for sharing that. Security department. Thank much job to the higher ups. Doesn't make the company, yeah. Doesn't make the company money, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think this was this was what we were talking about, uh, Taddy, about uh, security or like blue team stuff being like think less in the sense that we don't make the company money. Except you're working a product company. See, that is a cheat code. If you're working a product company, you're basically making the company money because you're making a product or working on a security product that actually makes the company money. Uh, as a cheat code, if you're actually working a company that makes money doing security. Uh, but yeah, the actual security, internal security team doesn't actually make the company money. What do you want to say, Teddy? <laughs> that, that just sounded kind of confusing for a second. I was like, huh? Let me explain. But, Let me explain. So yeah. if you work at a product company, a security product company, or a company that has security products, you're making the company money doing security on that product in the sense that let's say you're bringing out detections with a product or you're like an MDR solution or a, 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 a MSSP solution, whatever, SOC, whatever, SOC as a service, whatever the case is, you're making the company money as a security person at that company. But if you're an internal security team, you are a cost center. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. That bet. Let's see. You have to Google for the APT info. Yep, we did that. Appreciate you for the pointer, though. Is there a way to act? Yes, there is a way to access it. It's going to be available uh, on the live stream. Uh, portion of my YouTube channel, let's go there and you're going to see it right after this. Uh, by the way, it'll be available for the next couple of weeks until we edit it. Once it's edited, it's going to go to only be available for members, but the actual investigation will be available on the main channel as a video. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for joining the stream. Thank you for joining the stream. Definitely. 
looking forward to the next one. We're still going to keep doing Spunk for the next one. I don't know what it's going to be yet, but yeah, it's going to be Spunk for sure because we've got a lot more lots of the stock investigations to do. Do you think we could probably do like an attack and defend thing in real time? Is that possible? We could. What do you think it? I have no idea. I don't. I, I, I'm trying to imagine how we'd go about it like in real time. Top five. I mean, we we could do something like, well, cloud would have been like the most efficient way to do this, because like we could just host it in like AWS, and then I'll just give you like access keys as like you know initial access or whatever, or you just find access keys in the GitHub repository or something, and then you start looking at your activities using CloudTrail. Can you share two screens at the same time? I don't know. We could probably figure it out. We could probably it. figure it out. Yeah, we could probably figure it out. We'll, we'll, we'll figure something out. We'll figure something out. The next live stream will be Splunk based as well. So keep an eye out for that. Um, it'll be more Splunk stuff. You're good at delivering information. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's a very kind comment. Thank you. I try. I, I, I think I speak too fast, but I, I try to you know deliver information accurately. So thank you for that majestic logic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for joining the stream. Uh, again, thank you to Taddy for joining us today. And um, yeah, I'll set out a, I'll put out a, uh, uh, an invite for the next stream next week Friday. And I hope to see you guys there as well. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you guys in the next video on Monday. Keep an eye out for that. Good night. See you. Peace. Peace.